Okay. So this is a little bit of abbreviated version of the, the um, information we had presented to the Vision Zero Equity Task Force, which Jessica was uh, graciously a member on. So we kind of talked about some of the data. Um, so first kind of walk through like what is equity and why is equity important in terms of traffic safety. Um, what Montgomery County and Tacoma Park demographics are, kind of give everyone kind of a base level view of what the demographics of the communities are like. A um, little bit of Vision Zero overview. Has anyone here never heard the word Vision Zero? It's okay. Because otherwise I'm going to ask someone, can you tell me what Vision Zero is? It's where we have zero pedestrian accidents and yeah. bicycle accidents. So there's, in the Vision Zero um, philosophy, there will still be crashes, unfortunately. So the idea with Vision Zero is that you know, crashes are, un are basically unavoidable because we're humans. We all make mistakes. We're fallible. We get distracted. Uh, we think about what's going on at work, we think about what's going on in our homes while we're driving. So even in the best case scenario, we still have crashes. Uh, in the county, unfortunately, they'll back up traffic. The idea of Vision Zero is, okay, we engineer around the human, the human elements, whether they're walking, driving, or cycling. And with these kind of changes, using either engineering techniques, enforcement, or education, we can make sure that if the crash does occur, it happens at a low, low enough energy, so usually lower speeds, that everyone walks away from the crash or has scrapes, bruises. So that's the biggest thing. It's not just for pedestrians and bicyclists. Uh, it does include people in vehicles, um, drivers, and occupants. So it's trying to get to a, a, a place where um, the county's goal is by 2030 to have a uh, county where there are no severe injuries or fatalities. And a severe injury uh, is defined, it's kind of a broad spectrum from anything to where you know, you're on life support and kind of on the edge to you had a broken bone. So basically anything broken, if you're unconscious, uh, if there's some sort of la deep lacerations, those are what we can consider severe injuries. So you see severe or serious injuries throughout the presentation, that's what I'm referring to. And don't worry, most people have that same thing, so that's why I usually ask, because people have heard the term, but they're like, especially depending on the crowd, sometimes they're like, Oh, it's just about the pedestrians. That's all you care about. You want to, you hate the cars and yada yada yada. So we have to say it's like it's about all roadway users and making sure that everyone's safe. Yes. What happens after 2030? What if happens? We don't need vision zero. We, we keep going at it. Um, so uh, I'll jump ahead a little bit because of the question. So it's vision zero really the concept of vision zero started in Sweden in the mid 90s, uh, like 1997 is kind of when they adopted it. They're still not at zero. They're still, but they do have the lowest fatality rates of any developed country in the world. So even if we don't get to zero then, the idea is we keep moving towards it. That's kind of the goal. Because um, I think to get there, I mean, realistically, it's going to be tough given some of the financial realities, what would have to happen in, t in a decade to get that. I don't think people want us to unfund their schools to uh, re-engineer the roadways to slow people down. So there are things that we can change. And we can talk about in the, our Vision Zero Action Plan what we're doing within our current resources, kind of re redo how we do things internally. And a big part of that was the equity task force. Um, so I jump right back to this. All right, so I'll ask someone else. Who can tell me what equity means? It's on the sound slide. Anyone? Exactly. So that's the that's the broadest. That's the broadest. So it gets it gets it can get really complicated. Some you know um, the county executive and the county council have adopted a racial equity platform. So that's looking at things in terms of uh, historical racism, especially between disenfranchisement of African Americans. Uh, actually, for our Vision Zero Equity Task Force, we added what we call multiple equity lenses. So we also looked at safety for seniors, for students, um, for racial and ethnic minorities. Um, they're all affected by disproportionately by uh, traffic violence, which I'll kind of talk about in a little bit. But that's the thing is a lot of people think equity means equality, and that's kind of where we've kind of been in the past in terms of pre-Vision Zero. It's anyone can call a county and ask for a traffic study, and it's kind of a reactive way of doing it. So with equity, it actually puts a more proactive approach to it as well. So, of course, Montgomery County, um, it's known as a very wealthy, affluent county, and I'll kind of talk about and break that down about it is true and untrue in certain places. So overall, the Montgomery County <coughs> population is uh, about 1.1 million uh, in 2018 and 2019. Uh, this data here is actually from the fiscal, uh, 2017 Census ACS, uh, American Community Survey. Uh, and Tacoma Park's just short of, uh, it's about 17,600, so it's just short of 18, so about 1.6% of the county population lives in the city of Tacoma Park. 
uh, income, 17th highest median household income among all U.S. counties, uh, $103,000. Again, this, part of that's also because they have a lot of dual income households. That's why it's much higher. Also, very highly educated population uh, with the federal government and a lot of uh, uh, laboratories in the area. So, sixth highest percent of attaining postgraduate degrees in among U.S. counties. That's similar. Um, that's, and the Tacoma Park numbers are very similar to this in terms of the overall numbers for education attainment. So again, we look at the county level, like, wow, what a, what a, you know, the streets are paved in gold, right? So the United States average median income is about 55,000. No area in the county uh, falls below that level. The lowest is uh, the Silver Spring area, which includes the city of Tacoma Park um, for what we call our regional service center areas. The county splits the county up into uh, these five areas, which each have a regional service center director. So Silver Spring does include downtown Silver Spring, Tacoma Park, and Long Branch. So that's 75,000, but still well above the median income. But let's say we break that down further. So again, Montgomery County, there's a red dot here. Here's the averages. Wow, wealthy. But let's say we break that down to every neighborhood. So we have 215 what we call census tracts. Um, so basically considered neighborhoods. They're usually about equal size. So now let's compare those to the other county averages. So we're all over the place. So here's Bethesda, Chevy Chase, Potomac over here. And then all the way through here, we have some of the, these areas actually fall well below the, the US averages. So a wide range within our 1 million county residents across our 215 neighborhoods. Not only talking about income, but also um, differences in uh, the racial makeup of the county. So uh, overall in the county, these are countywide statistics on this slide. The next slide, we'll talk about Tacoma Park in particular. Um, the milestone we hit in the 2010 census was that there were more, uh, the white non-Hispanic population became a plurality instead of the majority in the county. And that's shown here over time. And that's still increasing at this number as of 2017 data. And the yellow line here, you can see the Hispanic and Asian populations increasing. This map is also 2010 census data. Uh, each dot represents one person. Uh, it's not their actual address, it's kind of randomly assigned, but it's fairly close. And of course, you can see it here in the down county, much more uh, split kind of along the railroad tracks. Again, a lot of dominate from the uh, southwest corner of white population, you know, Hispanic population up near Wheaton, Glenmont, uh, and then more mixed down here in Long Branch. It's actually interesting to see is when you break it and look at up county, Gaithersburg, Germantown, Montgomery Village, it's much more mixed. And part of that, again, we talk about equity. There, you have to talk about the historic uh, racism uh, built into our communities. And part of that here is a lot of these down county places had racial covenants. Uh, they were basically in place till sometimes the 60s. Um, so basically you couldn't sell if you were a white homeowner to anyone who was not a white homeowner. A lot of them also had religious covenants, so they could not sell to someone of Jewish descent. So you can see over time, as those covenants became illegal and we started building these communities down in the 80s and 90s, uh, that history wasn't there, so the communities became much more integrated. So zooming into the city of Tacoma Park, um, again, they actually hit that milestone of majority minority uh, actually way back in between the 1990 and 2000 census. Um, but overall, the population and distribution of the population in terms of race and ethnicity has been fairly flat uh, since 2000. And again, this is a lot of single family homes along here, so uh, kind of uh, one of the few majority white neighborhoods in Tacoma Park. Uh, also, the density around here for multifamily housing here and up here, as well as along, so here's New Hampshire. These are some other statistics comparing the county to the Tacoma Park. Um, so we got high public transit use, which we kind of would expect uh, with a metro station close by. Uh, higher uh, renter occupied housing compared to the county average. Um, but the good news is the percent of renters spending 35% or more on their rent, which is considered housing burden, is actually slightly lower than the county average. Um, fairly equal levels of limited English households. So that means they cannot, uh, at least one person in the household cannot speak English at least somewhat well. Um, the 65 plus, po 65 or better population is uh, slightly lower to Cone Park compared to the county average. The mean household income is also a bit lower at 87 compared to 103. 
So we kind of talked about this vision zero principles. And we're kind of going to see like where the vision zero principles and kind of the equity lenses kind of align in the next couple of slides. So again, kind of want to point out what type of vision zero principles. Speed is key. Um, so if you're hit by a vehicle traveling 20 miles per hour, the pedestrian has a 9 out of 10 chance to survive. Again, this is kind of for your average pedestrian. The number is lower for children and uh, seniors. Jump 10 miles an hour, you're down to 50%. Then 10 miles an hour more, and you're at only about 10% chance of survival. So how speeds work is a big part of whether or not a pedestrian can survive a crash. Similar for the driver, too. The faster they're going, the kind of driver cone of vision narrows. So 15 miles an hour, you can kind of see across the entire uh, right of way. At 30 miles an hour, you can kind of look dead set in front of you. So a lot of times when you see the reports of the pedestrian involved collision, they'll see the drivers always say, I didn't see them. And they're probably not lying. They didn't see them because they probably couldn't even see, based on where their attention could go, to the kind of the edge of the, edge of the roadway. So since it's the Complete Streets Committee, I want to bring an example of Complete Streets and how that fits into Vision Zero. So this actually comes from the uh, Veers Mill Road Master Plan, which was passed last year. Um, still implementing parts. There's some changes we made already, but uh, BRT is still, still in the works. Um, this is an example of Complete Streets here. When we think about Complete Streets, a lot of it is on a high speed arterial like Veers Mill Road with a lot of traffic, you want to actually separate the roadway users. And this is kind of a good example of that. So we have shared use paths for bike, bicyclists and uh, pedestrians. Uh, the red is uh, for BRT, bus rapid transit lanes, separated from the rest of the traffic. You have general purpose travel lanes in between. Um, some other key features here is this kind of bump out with the grassy median here that shortens the pedestrian's distance to cross, which is very key. Uh, you'll see more curb outs and bump outs uh, along county roads in the future because that actually helps slow people down. It also gets cars to turn at a wider radius, which gets them to slow as they turn. When you shorten the crossing distance, again, that's less time that the pedestrian or cyclist is exposed to the uh, vehicular traffic, which makes them safer. Uh, pedestrian refuge, let's so say you're, you can't get across in the amount of time, you have a safe place to be. And the bus stop location, a near side along the crosswalk, uh, we find a lot of pedestrian crashes happen with uh, you know, getting to and from bus stops. I actually got off the bus today to go get the, uh, the car for driving here, and the guy ran down the opposite side of the road and then across because he saw the bus come and he needed to get that bus. So uh, it's uh, where we place the buses and how well people know the schedules can really affect the safety of places. So another idea is with complete streets that are actually being implemented in the county. So pedestrian scrambles, if you think if you've been in Chinatown near the gate, now they have the diagonal crossing. We actually have one in Bethesda that's like this. We haven't painted the diagonal, but people actually are crossing anyway diagonally we've seen. It's near the Bethesda Library. So in the pedestrian <coughs> scramble, all vehicular traffic stops and all pedestrians can cross each way. Protected bike lanes, uh, our most recent one that opened in 2nd Avenue and Wayne Avenue in Silver Spring, connects to the Spring Street cycle track all the way through to Wayne Avenue. And again, we talked about the last, the last time, you're actually separating the cyclists from the pedestrians and from the vehicular traffic to, give, to increase safety for everyone, make everyone have a comfortable feel on, along the roadway. And important here, especially if you didn't take away any parking, which always makes everyone happy. Uh, it's not always possible. Um, has anyone come across one of these in, in either Montgomery County or in the district at Hawk Beacon? So this is actually a GIF of how it works. So there's kind of three lights. Uh, first, it's very similar. It's, instead of having red, yellow, green, there's just yellow and green. So what engineers like about these, they actually became really popular in the southwest. Um, and finally kind of made their way east. The district was doing a lot of this the last couple of years, and we've been installed. Uh, there's a long like, legislative history that didn't allow these to be used in the state of Maryland for a while, but now they're allowed. Um, we've, the county's installed two or three. Uh, the state has installed two and a modified one, and we have about three or four in the works all throughout the county. So in the, in the hawk signal, you'll get the yellow to flash. It'll be, usually be dark. We do have some that are called modified hawks. They will flash all the time, kind of like a, a firehouse signal, just to alert you that there'll be pedestrian traffic. 
So the pedestrian has to activate the hawk signal. Uh, some places actually thought about doing like passive detection, so the pedestrian standing there will turn on. Uh, that's always rough because you, you never know if the sensor's working. Um, so it'll flash yellow to alert the driver that you need to get ready to yield, just like any other yellow light. When it goes into the red phase, it will, like any other red signal, red means stop. Uh, one thing you'll see different between Maryland and the district, which is a little tough when you're trying to teach when you drive so closely and a lot of people drive in and out of the state boundaries so often, is our signals will not have the flashing phase, which you'll see up next. So in the flashing phase, if you're like on Wisconsin Avenue in the, the district, you can actually just come to a complete stop and then continue on. Uh, we have not implemented that in the state. We just have it go solid red and then dark again. The nice thing for the pedestrians, it's the same. It's the red hand and then the white walk second signal. Other complete streets designs that we're working on is signal timing. So the, as part of the visions, you're. <laughs> go ahead. Um, explain to me how this is any better than a regular traffic light. Yeah. So when we do the assessments, um, you know, we if we needed full traffic light, we would do that. We actually did that with um, Randolph Road and Livingston Street. It originally was going to be designed for a hawk, but then they after they saw the traffic and what was needed there, they actually upgraded to a full signal. So there's this document, if you've been involved with pedestrian safety for all, it's called the MUTCD, which is the Manual Uniform Traffic MUT Control Devices. And it's kind of a federal guideline um, slash law that must be followed. Uh, basically, so when you drive anywhere in America, things don't like magically turn purple signs to green signs. Um, so it also sets thresholds and guidelines for when a stop sign should be installed, when a flashing sign could be installed, like just like yellow lights, amber lights, uh, or uh, a hawk signal. So the nice thing about the hawk signal is if the warrants aren't met for a full traffic signal, you actually have less pedestrian crossings or less traffic, you can put in one of these so you can still protect, protect the crossing and they're a little bit cheaper than a full signal as well. Um, we're actually updating all of our standards right now in the Montgomery County as part of our Vision Zero action plan to include our complete streets design guidelines, our markings and signals to kind of figure out what in the, in the county context, because obviously we have the urban areas down county, the suburban areas kind of mid county, then up county we have farms. So this doesn't always work in all the places where we would want to make some sort of uh, change to the road. So we want to make sure that when we're doing this it's somewhat uniform and predictable for folks. But those are kind of the main reasons. It's slightly, sometimes it can be cheaper, not a lot cheaper, but cheaper and it can be used at a lower threshold for pedestrian crossings. Is there a voiceover on those crossings? Uh, yes. It'll, it's just like a normal, it's like when you're a pedestrian, it, it doesn't look any different. You see the red guy, you, you push the button, uh, you know, it'll give you the same kind of warning. And then when it goes, it'll give you the kind of beeping, clicking noise as well. And the same thing on the pedestrian scramble when you're, when you're crossing diagonal, mm -hmm. does the voice, does the voiceover indicate that, that you can cross all ways? I'm not sure. I'd have, I guess I haven't been listening for it. Uh, I'd have to go check, but I think it, I don't know if it changes, because normally the signal said you can now cross like Piney Branch Road. I don't know if it just says you can now cross, or I don't know, I'm not sure what the actual um, call is, but if it just says, because some of our signals, like in Silver Spring, right, they only click. They don't really, they're not a voice. So I'm not, it depends on what they implemented there. Um, and if it uh, has been marked as well. Right, but if you're blind, you can't, you don't know that. Mm -hmm. Right, so that's what we, we're trying to figure out, right? If we have an, a pedestrian scramble we put in Bethesda, do we want to encourage the diagonal crossing? What does that look like? So that'll be part of our kind of updates as we figure out how to do that. There's some other areas we're looking at for pedestrian scrambles, but that's the first one we've implemented kind of as a, as a test pilot because we did a whole Arlington Road uh, redesign, and that was just part of it. I should warn you, I'm not an engineer, so I'm just like hearing what I hear from engineers. So if you have any questions or think specific about that, I can always follow up and uh, get you an answer as well. Uh, so the last thing here is obviously lighting is very important, especially on days like today. That's why we have these uh, reflective gear that we give out to folks when we meet uh, out in public. I'm not a good example wearing all black tonight. Um, but we have two different uh, capital improvement projects in the county. One is to update all of our lights to LED lights. One for cost savings, so they use way less energy. And they, can, one, and they also last uh, longer. 
So we have less light outages, because I was driving down Beers Mill Road, I noticed some, so I gotta go back, I drive back, make a note of where they were and report those in. Um, we also have a second project for our central business district. So right now we're in Bethesda doing more infill lighting to bring it more to the pedestrian level, because obviously the, this, everything we used to do, right, was built for the, the drivers. So even the lighting was set up for drivers, what made sense for them when they had their headlights on. So now we're trying to make things more uh, safer for everyone, especially for pedestrians and cyclists, um, more lighting, more pedestrian level lighting near crosswalks. Yes. What, what kind of pedestrian level lighting are you doing? Are they like sort of more decorative? No, nah, just slightly or are they aimed directly at the crosswalks? So that's actually interesting. Someone explained this to me. You actually don't aim it directly at the crosswalks, actually to the sides. If you put it right over the crosswalk, they actually basically wash out the pedestrians. They kind of put them like this and they light kind of the whole area. And that's what they will do at crosswalks. So again, here's your severe and fatal collisions by year. Uh, in 2012, we had well over 500 and it slowly declined, especially for drivers and passengers, the most. Um, for pedestrians in the county, we've kind of stabilized. We had one year below 70, but last, uh, you know, six years, we really haven't had that. And for cyclists, again, right around 15 each year. Uh, for this year, year to date, uh, we expect to be very similar, much lower on the driver passenger numbers. Uh, that's continuing to climb, but we figure we'll be actually fairly within this range for um, 2019 as well. Uh, what we're seeing nationwide is actually, we're kind of holding steady in Montgomery County in terms of our severe and fatal crashes, but for the rest of the nation, the pedestrian and fatal and cyclist fatal numbers are actually increasing quite dramatically. Um, so we want obviously to go down, it's our goal, but Holding steady is better than what we're seeing elsewhere in the, in the nation. So here's the Tacoma Park numbers. The good news is uh, there's not a lot here. That's the good news. So like the rest of the county, the most are for drivers and passengers. Uh, the peak was seven in 2017. I'm only showing one for 2015. I need to check and make sure it's not a data error. That was the year that we switched systems for the state for reporting. And I'm not sure if, um, Tacoma Park Police had switched over yet completely, but that's what maybe artificially low. But otherwise, you know, three, seven, and two. So uh, overall, fairly low numbers. Can you just go back to the previous one? Yep. So if we're looking at this, so pedestrians involved, we have, let's say we have data for what, 2015, 2016, 2017, we're at like 76, mm -hmm. 52, and so forth. Go to the next one. Mm -hmm. We have one, three, and one, or something like that. Okay. So mm -hmm. right, it's Tacoma Park. So, but we are only one percent of the population in Montgomery County. So right. If you mix it, if you combine that, we're way above average, because it would be if you're one percent, that would translate to 100, 300. Um, in obviously, it's low numbers of you know low data, etc. Mm -hmm. But we kind of seem to be above average. One point six percent. So. If we're 1.6% of the population, does that work? Yeah. You can't run stats on that. Yeah. No, I yeah. mean, it, the numbers are really small, but I still right. see your point. It's not yeah. nothing, given right. what a small fraction of the exactly. county we are. Yeah. Right. And I, this isn't adjusted. I didn't get a chance to do it against the, um, we have data on how much, uh, for the non-local roads, we have the number of traffic each year. I didn't get a chance to run it against the, um, normalize it for traffic numbers. Mm -hmm. But that's just the, this is the absolute counts. So one of the things you'll see a lot in Vision Zero Action Plans is what they call a high injury network. So for Montgomery County's two-year action plan, I developed a, our high injury network. These are um, roadway segments with at least five or more crashes during the five-year study period. And they had, more, had to have more than one crash per mile, so it's the amount of crash density. Um, so nothing in the city of Tacoma Park, but we, in the nearby we have, this is Piney Branch Road just north of Tacoma Park. Uh, this is New Hampshire Avenue coming in and out of uh, Montgomery and Prince George's County. This is Georgia Avenue in downtown Silver Spring. And again, Georgia Avenue between uh, downtown Silver Spring and downtown Wheaton. And a lot of it up county, because that's one thing we don't always talk about in, we think about pedestrians, we always think about Bethesda, Silver Spring, because we think those are pedestrian areas. But when we actually look at and adjust for severity, um, the up county starts showing up much more in Middlebrook Road, Germantown Road, Frederick Avenue, uh, Frederick Ave, Rockville Pike. Uh, since Tacoma Park's police department keeps its own, you know, has its own jurisdiction and keeps its own data and mm. so forth, 
would your data that you have there reflect the same level of detail and information that you have for the rest of the county, or is Tacoma yeah. Park an outlier? In some so way? since we last talked, I actually have Tacoma Park's data. We we had a MOU with them. Um, it's actually the state's data, but we now have permission from Tacoma Park to publish their data on our open data portal. So if you go to the open uh, data.montgomerycountymd.gov, uh, you can filter on the municipal code Tacoma Park, and that will include reports for um, state police as w and Montgomery County Police and Tacoma Park if it's within the boundary of Tacoma Park. So again, zooming in a little bit more, these are the most serious and failed crashes that happened in Tacoma Park during the 2015 to 2018. Uh, there were on average three serious and fatal crashes with a high of seven in 2017 and a low of one in 2015. Uh, four were pedestrians, which are marked in the blue dots here, and then the one cyclist right here. Uh, and the fatal crash, I don't have it specially marked on this chart. Let me just double check where that one was. Uh, there was two fatal crashes out of these. Uh, yeah, New Hampshire Avenue was one of them. So we, on August 20th, 2016, at University Avenue, Merrimack Drive, that was underneath this dot, the one pedestrian, there was a driver that was killed there. And on uh, November 11th, 2017, New Hampshire Avenue and Larch Avenue uh, was a pedestrian. So that must be that right there. So again, very similar to what we have in the rest of the county, most because a lot of the traffic is handled on by the State the Highway Administration. Uh, you see a lot of the crashes that are serious and fatal occurring along uh, state maintained roadway, so Philadelphia, Ethan Allen, uh, New Hampshire, and University. When we were doing this vision study with the State Highway Administration mm -hmm. about one of the intersections here, they had some maps showing quite a number of, of accidents mm -hmm. of a variety of, of severity, and they there were definitely more than are reflected here, but I think it was because they included everything, not just severe, serious yeah. and fatal crashes. Oh good, you have yeah. the data also. Okay. Yeah, so these are all pedestrian, I, don't, I haven't included the, um, so these are all injury types, just bike and crash. I excluded the uh, vehicle crashes, because that's about 150 of those a year, uh, with all the injuries. So again, those anything from a fender bender, they can get a report. Um, so no surprise here again, Philadelphia Avenue. Uh, you see the numbers on here, that means there's kind of dots that are on top of dots. So we have three here, three here, two here, two here. And I'll note that these are mapped to the nearest intersection so that it may have actually happened in mid-block or uh, somewhere else, but the way that we map it is to the nearest intersection. So it could be you know kind of anywhere in between here. But the pattern is very similar. Again, uh, the major roadways have the most conflict zones and that's where you see kind of the most uh, crashes. Again, cyclists are red and pedestrians are blue. So again, 71% occur on ASHA maintained roadways, 29% on Tacoma Park roads. The county does not uh, maintain any roadways within Montgomery County, or sorry, we do in Montgomery County, uh, inside the city of Tacoma Park. I have just a question because um, we're bordering, of course, the district and um, PG County, mm -hmm. and uh, New Hampshire and Eastern, like are, I want to say shared, I'm not quite sure, but sort of like there's this jurisdictional issue. Yeah, so Eastern is all the district. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and then, um, so I'm just wondering, like, is there data, because New Hampshire is sort of like, I feel like this, you know, it's so close that it, even that data should be at least relevant for our discussion here, even mm -hmm. though it's maybe in PG County, it may not be part of Tacoma Park, mm -hmm. but is there any clarity on, especially because there are also state highways, any data that um, you're able to pull? Probably? So I can only pull what's in the county, because that's what we, we filter on. So the state does have it. Um, mm -hmm. So like when it goes in and out of the county, I'll, like, there's just a hole there, because mm -hmm. you know, they're not my roads, I can't do anything about it, but the state does have that data. Um, for, so for anything the state, the state police are writing or Prince George's County police are writing, you would be able to see that. So to clarify, if Eastern Avenue was like lined with crashes, it would still look like that because they would only be in the DC database? Yeah, I mean, there would be perhaps, I mean, per chance there would be, you know, one that would be, if, you know, print, if DC wasn't there on time and Tuam Park or Montgomery County police did it, but yeah, basically the property line for the District of Columbia actually goes a little bit almost to the sidewalk across. Mm -hmm. So if you ever see like car to go along Eastern Avenue here, or actually, yeah, 
You can actually still park there because that's district property still. Yeah. I made sure, so I didn't get a ticket. <laughs> so important thing, remember we talked a little bit earlier about speed and safety. So the blue lines are the number of roadways with uh, greater than or equal to 30 miles per hour speed limit. So no roadway within the uh, Tacoma Park city limits is above 35 miles per hour. The only 35 miles per hour marked roads are New Hampshire Avenue and University Boulevard. Uh, and then Carroll, this segment here is 30 miles an hour. And then Philadelphia right on the edge is 30. And then drops down to 25 once you get across uh, 320 there. On that point, mm -hmm. does the county have anything to do with the speed limits, or would it be the state that if we wanted to address that speed limit issue, because it's been raised with me at least mm -hmm. by Ward 1 people, where would we go? Would we go to State Highway? or? Yeah, so you would have to make a request through, like, uh, I'm assuming that District 3 also covers uh, yes. Scone Park. Yeah. So, yeah, like Derek Gunn and his shop would be the ones who would be out there studying. And they are, um, SHA and I, and the county are giving a full update to the county council next week on the 19th. And part of what the SHA is going to be um, releasing soon is a context sensitive design guidelines. So understand that Garrett County and Montgomery County are different, who'd have thought. Um, having better designs for their urban roads versus what's out in you know the mountains. So they'll be releasing that soon. So I'll have some highlights, I think, uh, for the county council on the 19th. I've seen bits and pieces of it. So it's uh, definitely going the right direction. And they've already lowered speed limits throughout the county. Uh, River Road has lowered speed limits. Yeah. Georgia Avenue has, speed limits have been lowered. Um, trying to think where else nearby. Georgia's big one. Beers Mill Road, I just saw, got re reduced to 25 uh, going into the Wheaton wow. District. And they also just upgrade all the crosswalks there. So um, yeah, they're, they're, they're OK with lowering speed limits now. So uh, that's a possibility. He asked me to ask, so that's why I am. <laughs> yeah. So lastly, I don't want to bore you. This is the Vision Zero two-year action plan. We're at the end of end of its time, so I got to write the next one. Um, there were 41 action items. We broke them up between uh, the traditional three E's of traffic safety, engineering, enforcement, education. We also had traffic incident management. Uh, this is kind of one to keep our police officers safe. We had a police officer killed by a drunk driver a couple years ago, Noah Leota. Uh, he was doing uh, drunk driving enforcement, and a drunk driver came along and killed him outside of his cruiser. We also had an incident on the Beltway where two of our EMTs were uh, seriously injured by a drunk driver. So we want to make sure that we kept our um, first responders safe as well, and trying to avoid secondary crashes. Because sometimes the secondary crash outside of the zone can be worse than the first crash that's on scene. And then we had kind of a catch-all of law policy and advocacy. So that included our work with the Equity Task Force, I uh, worked work with Annapolis. Uh, one of the big things that happened in the last two years for Vision Zero was the state actually adopted Vision Zero. Uh, former uh, Rockville Councilwoman, uh, I'm last name's Carr. Okay. Yeah, so she uh, moved the, the state to uh, Vision Zero. Uh, I'm trying to think of some other things that are there, but those are kind of the mid bigger ones. So we're kind of all pulling on the same rope in the same direction. So we talked about community outcomes, we talked about Vision Zero. So when we layer them together, what does that look like? And what does that mean for equity? So these are drivers, pedestrians, and cyclists. They were either killed or severely injured. And then it's adjusted by the uh, age group. And this is for countywide. Uh, red is kind of the highlight in the outliers. You'll see the drivers, there's a 13-year-old in this group. He was driving an ATV and hurt himself. So that's why this age group's a little lower. But you really see for drivers, it's really our youngest and oldest drivers that are most at risk on our roadways, which you expect you have very inexperienced drivers, and then folks who have a slower reaction time. Um, so one of the things we do for our education, too, we actually work with rec, de rec departments and AARP to have uh, programming that's aimed at older drivers, and also talking with the drivers and their families about when to, how to have a discussion about potentially uh, giving up their license and what options are available for people after they don't have their license. For pedestrians, it largely increases with age, the outlier group being 20 to 29. Um, that can be a tough group to re outreach to because this is a group that's not in school anymore, maybe not so engaged with the community. So it comes to the education side of it, kind of tougher group to reach. For cyclists, uh, the biggest outlier group, again, there's luckily not a lot of cyclists killed or severely injured, so these numbers are a little, they bounce around a little bit, was the 10 to 19 age group. That did veer a little bit closer, closer to the high school group. 
So one thing we're working on in our Vision Zero Action Plan in Montgomery County is we've had a pilot um, through our Excel Beyond the Bell program to pilot a after-school bike safety class with um, about 30 kids, and they all finished and graduated. They all got helmets, they all got bikes. And then we're still working with MCPS to figure out, can we basically bring a, into the school a curriculum to have bike safety at third or fourth grade or potentially middle school? Yeah, I see that that's per 100,000 population, but if it were per cyclist, the rate of uh, cyclists 80 and above who got killed or se severely injured would be much higher. So, right. Uh, you would expect there to be more pedestrians from 20 to 29 than say 80 plus because there are more pedestrians. Yeah, and out, that's always a out, out there. Uh, so I know it would be a tough thing, but if yeah. if it were adjusted by people well, actually engaging kind of in the activity yeah. at that age, then it would, they would look very different. Right, and that's where we talk about vulnerability, mm -hmm. right? Like if you're if you're young, it's you're much more highly likely to survive a crash. Um, so and these groups are much more vulnerable to the severity of the crash. And that's always a tough thing with these numbers too, is trying to get like a good baseline. Because the you know, Federal Highway Administration requires you to collect data on uh, traffic for vehicles, but it's not required to collect data on pedestrians. So when we look at our data, we have, may have an intersection study for a development here from last year, and then you go block north, and it's, it was 20 years ago, and then it was 10 years, and six years. So um, there are some newer folks, as everyone's kind of struggling with this at the same time. So there's some newer groups, data groups, trying to model out pedestrian activity, and we're looking to do that. Uh, with our pedestrian master plan at the county-wide level. So for um, the sex of the person killed or severely injured, again, uh, females make about 51, 52% of the entire county population. Uh, this slide just tells you that men are dumb. So drivers, 57% uh, were male. For pedestrians, 52%. And then for cyclists, 78%. Um, so again, you talk about population, we also have a lot more people who are cyclists that are males. Uh, so that number, sh we expect to have slightly shifted, but also kind of shows the importance of what we have in our bicycle master plan uh, that was passed just last year uh, by the county council, is basically people who are cycling on our roadways today, like these are the road warriors, right? They love to like get in traffic and ride around in traffic, uh, so much more risk loving. But as we build these protected bicycle intersections and bike lanes, we want to build something that's comfortable for maybe a mom and her kid, um, so you're separated from traffic, you're feeling good, so we think that not only will keep everyone safe, but actually will encourage more people to uh, cycle even for smaller trips or shorter trips. So within the crash database, we don't collect data on race or ethnicity of the persons involved in the crash. This actually comes from, uh, these are just traffic fatalities in the county. Uh, this comes from uh, basically death records. And these are again just for 100,000 population. So for traffic deaths, uh, we have blue or Hispanic, uh, black or, Af black or African-American in the pink, and then uh, white non Hispanic in the yellow. And you can see for pedestrians, the really wide gap, you know, three times higher between uh, non-Hispanic whites and Hispanics in the county, and a slight difference also between vehicle occupants uh, for black or African-American residents. Um, and part of why that's the reason we see that's a lot of, uh, you know, think about like high rises or multifamily units, which tend to be more diverse. Those are along arterial roadways, so these people are having to cross these six, eight lane roads more often versus if you live in a you know, cul-de-sac, you're usually getting out of your car, you're less exposed to uh, those, having to cross those major arterials. And again, that goes back to the equity argument we, we were talking about earlier. This is also due to, you know, historically, the squeaky wheel issue where the neighborhoods that can scream the loudest gets, get what they want, so they're getting the upgrades, they're getting the bump outs, they're getting the speed bumps, um, while other neighborhoods that have higher rates That's actually aren't getting it. Economic equity. Exactly. <laughs> I just have a quick question on yeah. that. Um, you noted that ethnicity and race is not captured in the crash data. Mm -hmm. So is that, do you only have it for deaths, not for serious injuries? Yeah, so this actually does not come from the same source at all. This just comes from uh, death records. And that's also a little bit wonky, too, because the way that um, the CDC gives you the data is based on where the person lived. So if you, know, you live in Montgomery County, but you were walking in Seattle, your number would count over in Montgomery County. So it's not quite apples to apples, but it was a question that was asked. So we try to get some data, and this is like the best we could get at the time. 
So again, we kind of layer all the information together. What our demographic data and our crash data, what do we learn about our county? Um, so the areas marked in red are what we call equity emphasis areas. These were developed by the Council of Governments for a different project, but it basically made an index based on uh, income and household size and age. And they looked at those variables and kind of created these kind of equity emphasis areas. So anything marked in red, and these are all those, these 215 neighborhoods I talked about earlier. So again, you have Rockville Pike, uh, Aspen Hill, Wheaton, CBD, Long Branch right around along here, and uh, Gaithersburg. And so when you lay that information, the equity emphasis areas, and these are collisions per square mile, and these are severe and fatal collisions. Um, all the yellow being very few severe fatal collisions, all the way up to like Wheaton CBD, and this one right down downtown Bethesda being some of the highest in the county, also downtown Silver Spring as well. So when we layer all those things together and do some math and see what comes out, we see that crash density is higher in neighborhoods with a percentage of households that speak English less than very well, higher percentage of the population that is either Hispanic or Latino, a higher percentage of households that are below poverty and have a lower median age. So when we layer all that together, we're seeing that um, the way that our neighborhoods are separated also affects the traffic safety in our neighborhoods. So we have additional data uh, about our community neighborhoods. If you go to stat.montgomerycountymd.gov, you have a community explorer where you can actually click on Tacoma Park and get more in-depth data and actually move things around. The quality of life survey, we pay uh, every other year now, we have a community-wide survey and uh, we'll be releasing the 2019 results soon. Uh, this is also a geo geospatial program, MC Insights, where you can kind of drag and drop, uh, turn layers off and on and see the data. And then we also have uh, crash data. It's available. It updates every Friday based on our open data portal. So if you go to our Vision Zero webpage, montgomerycountymd.gov slash Vision Zero, click on the data button, and you can actually download the data yourself and play with it. It's in three data sets, one's for the overall crash, one's for the driver and vehicle, and one for bicyclists and uh, pedestrians. If you click on the crash dashboard, you'll get maps like this where you can go ahead and uh, zoom in and out and see what different neighborhoods look like. And I will warn you, this data is based on the, where the officer put in the uh, location. So you see like this one in the district. It's actually not in the district. It's just where he pushed the button. So they're, they're getting better, but there's still some you know, cleanup to do on that end. Could you, I'm sorry, on that slide, where it says traffic violations. Mm -hmm. So would that be like if somebody runs a red light, that would count as a traffic violation? that looks sort of like a red light camera, I can't tell. Like if we wanted to see what our Tacoma Park um, red light cameras were capturing, yeah. would it be? So this data is only from, so while the crash dash data we have pretty much for all the municipalities uh, in the county, this data set is actually just for Montgomery County Police uh, issue tickets and does not include red, white, red lights or speed camera tickets. Uh, hopefully in our next contract we'll be getting that more frequently, but for right now it's just officer initiated speeding, red light, uh, or not red, sorry, not red light, or well, if they run a red light, they can get pulled over. Um, so to bring up speed elevator, we are kind of turning the equity task force. Again, the, the task force kind of wrapped up in, in July. We've been drafting it for a mm -hmm. while. we will have results out soon. But one of the kind of bigger things we kind of talked about when we just went through all the three E's and what the county does for protecting our pedestrians, cyclists, and drivers. Um, how are projects selected? Is the squeaky wheel getting the oil? Again, a lot of the way that pretty much every government set up this way where community says we need X, they go study X, and then either gets done or gets, or gets funded or doesn't get funded. Um, one thing we want to actually do in the county in the next couple of years is to figure out how we develop a triage or filtering system. Uh, the challenge we've had when we first started looking at this is whether or not the county is put on notice about a when someone asks for a safety uh, fix. So whether or not we can actually delay it or have some sort of triage process is a kind of a legal question, but I think there should be given the amount of demand that we have. Do all your residents actually know how to talk to the city or the county uh, to make a request? So like if you want to make a request to Cone Park, do you know who to call, what the number is? Is it best to go through your council person? Uh, a lot of people don't even know how to even how to start. And one thing we actually talked about um, 
with my contractors when they were doing similar work in the District of Columbia, they went to the high injury network into Columbia Heights and they're speaking to people who are more recent immigrants in the country and they asked them, well, you know, this place is pretty rough based on the data, like what do you guys think? And like, this is great. So they actually learned that because of their uh, past experience, they actually had changed the questions that they were asking on the street because uh, they weren't what they were expecting with, the, with people who are natives of the U.S. A big thing here, meeting people where they are to broaden the voices being heard. Uh, our planning department's kind of taking the lead on this. They're doing a lot more pop-up events and we're trying to do that as well. Trying to meet people at the shopping centers or at the schools, uh, you know, joining other PTA meetings, working with community associations to really talk to different neighborhoods about safety, what they're seeing in the neighborhood, and making sure and trying to potentially quantify where do we hear people the most and where are people silent that we need to actually be hearing from. Another part is, as your staff trained to identify implicit biases, a lot of times for governments, um, they train kind of frontline staff, not about customer service, but also potentially implicit bias. Uh, it's really important, I think, and something we're gonna look at in the county if the funding all comes out, is you know, could all employees potentially be trained in implicit bias and uh, racial bias? Because things like, uh, if you've seen the news recently, like Apple's could potentially be sued because their algorithm that determines your credit line for the Apple card was significantly biased against females, applicants. Uh, even Steve Wozniak's wife was given a lot of lesser credit line. So uh, people who sit behind a computer all day, they build implicit biases into algorithms and you know, they may not even know it until you see any real world results. Uh, especially when we talk about meeting people where they are, can someone on your outreach staff uh, speak common language spoken in your community? So if we know that we're gonna go out and speak in an area that has a predominantly Hispanic population, we obviously wanna make someone sure someone's bilingual. If we're in downtown Silver Spring, and it's parts of Cone Park and Long Branch, making someone who can uh, speak Spanish and other languages as well. Because if you wanna engage someone and they stare at you, you don't you get lost that opportunity. And obviously a, a heavy topic now is how does traffic safety enforcement work into this? Every community that's doing Vision Zero has first have to ask the question, can we even do enforcement? Uh, when we went through with the equity task force here, um, we said that yeah, enforcement has to be kind of part of it, um, but how we do it has to kind of change or when you look at how we do it. One thing we saw from San Francisco that was really effective was what they call focus on the five. They wanna make sure that 50% of the citations and warnings they write are actually for the most dangerous behaviors. So not for you know, window tinting and registration and licenses. It's actually, you know, how often are you going after distracted drivers? Because I'm sure if you've walked outside for two seconds, you're gonna see someone doing this, or mostly this. This is actually worse than looking down. Um, making sure we're actually trying to encourage good behaviors and actually curb dangerous behaviors uh, in terms of how we do enforcement. Uh, have more data. I'll send you this packet. There's a lot more data behind there, but any other questions? Uh, let me know. Um, I, I heard. Um, I don't know if I'm mistaken, but do you guys give out grants to cities for sidewalks and stuff, or is that? Uh, the Wait, state. Sorry, would you mind repeating her question, just so it's you, we can it can be heard. In the oh, room, right. Please. Yeah. So the question was, does the county give out grants to municipalities for sidewalks? I'm not. Uh, vision zero. Yeah, so specifically through Vision Zero, we do not have a grant process. We had an action item to do a grant, but it was more based on giving grants to community groups, similar to what the district was doing. Uh, that was never funded, so we don't have any grants that way. We usually get grants through State Highway or Maryland Highway Safety Office is how we usually get our grants, and those are available through the county and municipalities. Uh, but a lot of those grants are largely towards education and enforcement. Oh, okay. um, so it's not to implement strategies. Right, yeah, we, we tried actually to ask for like a traffic garden. We wanted to make a permanent traffic garden where kids can go and learn how to safely bicycle and learn about navigating and we didn't get that grant. Uh, we got some other ones, but we didn't get that grant. So we're looking for other opportunities for funding. There's also potentially nonprofits you can partner with. Uh, they may not be able to fund it, but they can potentially give you some uh, funding for research or outreach um, to different communities. There's also options as well, like Save Kids Worldwide. Has a lot of resources on that. Um, to go back to the speed limit question mm -hmm. on state highways, I was told by a representative from SHA that 
their policy is to set speed limits based on the 80, 85th percentile mm -hmm. of like speeds that drivers are traveling. So if you request a speed limit to be lowered, sometimes that can result in the speed limit actually being raised once they do a, mm -hmm. a study. Is that still their policy or are they softening on that? Right. Yes, yeah, so the question was how does the state evaluate speed limits? So this is one of these things that comes from an era of the car is king where they set things called the 85th percentile. That means what cars, if you, took away the, if you took away the speed limit sign and you watch how fast cars are driving, how fast does the 85th, 85th percentile car drive? And they say that's the speed limit should be, if they're all driving 37, we'll, at the 85th percentile, we'll bump it to 40 to make a nice round number. Um, I'm not sure how that's codified currently within the Maryland MUTCD and how they currently use that. I think it's still kind of like, it's what they've been taught in school, so I think that's still what they use. But now that these context-sensitive guidelines are coming out, I don't know how that's going to change that. Okay. I think maybe we should wrap it up because we are almost used to almost an hour of your time. I wanted to just conclude by um, asking you, are there questions that here at Tacoma Park we should have asked you that we didn't think to ask you <laughs> that you think we should be thinking about as we are figuring out how our Complete Safe Streets Committee is going to try and align with what the county is doing and, you know, prioritize uh, safety and community engagement. Right, so I think one thing that you, it's kind of like a standard process to do the Vision Zero Action Plan, right? It's kind of, you have your committee, check, good, we're good, step one's done. Then we start thinking about um, what's your crash data look like. So this is kind of a quick, quick and dirty version of your crash data. Again, there's not a lot, which is great, but then that makes it harder to really figure out, are these the best places to look at? And also don't forget, like, if you have municipal roads, there may be other things you can look at that it's not the crash data. Um, if you have information about intersection counts or you want to look at, one thing that we're doing for the county is an entire sidewalk inventory. Uh, we hadn't actually had a complete inventory in a while, so if you don't have that, there's some, you know, one thing we want to do in the tier action plan was figure out what our known unknowns were and figure those out. So that was, you know, the updates to the design guidelines, uh, sidewalk inventories, um, do we know where all our mid-block crossings are and where they are marked and unmarked? Do we know where um, all our signals and where, how are those times? Those kind of questions, figuring out what our known un unknowns were in the first year. So we really, it's gonna take a while to move that big ship of government over towards a vision zero mindset. And part of that was figuring out what do we actually need to know to get us to a vision zero frame? Do you ever look at what areas have more pedestrians and so that it can focus more resources towards those areas? Uh, it's tough because we don't actually have like a great systematic system-wide counts but usually when you look at where the pedestrian crashes are they're um, not surprising you know you love Bethesda, Silver Springs, CBDs, yeah. Germantown Transit Center, places where you have a lot of so there are places where um, you may not expect pedestrians or especially cyclists, but then you look at where the trail crossing was, you're like, oh, that's why they're there. They mm -hmm. came off the trail and that's where they were going. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, that's one thing we want to try with the pedestrian master plan is to figure out how we can better analyze where all our pedestrians are yeah. and estimating what their crossings look like where we don't have data. Um, we haven't quite fig figured out how best to do that yet. I'm sorry, I thought of one final question I want to ask you, especially because mm -hmm. Casey's here from the city council. Uh, there was a walkthrough recently along where the Purple Line route is going to go mm -hmm. through the community, and I guess there were a lot of pedestrian issues identified in the context of that of that walkthrough. Was somebody from your group present for that? Was somebody from the yeah, task force? Yeah, Tom, Tom Hucker was there, and um, I don't know if there's anyone there specifically from Vision Zero, but I know... Was Michael Paler? He's been there for something else, Maybe. but... Yeah, he might yeah. have been, yeah, but there were a number of people from the county over yeah. there. Yeah. yeah. So if we wanted to coordinate at Tacoma Park in an area where it's likely to be high on the county's list to pay attention to, is the Purple Line an area where where you are seeing a lot of focus given that it's going to be drawing a lot more pedestrians and crossings and stuff to that? Absolutely. So one thing we've done is we have this pr CIP program called the B Bicycle Pedestrian uh, Priority Area Projects, or BIPAs. And we've actually split out some of it to be just for Purple Line and making sure we have sidewalk gaps that are filled in because we're completely changing the way that people are walking in those neighborhoods where it would have been very low traffic so they didn't really prioritize sidewalks there. Making sure the sidewalks are gonna go in either near or, you know, if the money came in, we would 
shifted to cur more current, but right now it's shifted to the kind of 22, 23 out years in the six year budget. Um, but that's something we're concerned about. Um, University Boulevard is already very dangerous for pedestrians, and now that they've torn out the median and all the construction, uh, you know, we had a fatality on University Boulevard uh, just a couple weeks ago. So there was a lot of activity around that, working with the P3, the transit partners. The county also does have a full-time staffer uh, kind of as a liaison to the Purple Line, even though we're not, you know, the state's building it, but we make sure that we're always uh, working with them, uh, especially in downtown Bethesda. And that person was at the meeting. There were about like mm -hmm. 25 of us there, so yeah. I don't remember who was Yeah, there. so we want to make sure that, especially like places in Bethesda where you have like, you know, the Marriott headquarters, which is a different project, and then two blocks later you have Purple Line going on, and we're also going to build some new bicycle lanes, so there's a lot of coordination that needs to happen with these projects, and we want to make sure that we're proactive instead of waiting for disasters that are going to happen, and it's, and it's, it's tough because construction by its nature is messy. Um, if you're in Silver Springs soon, they're going to start putting the bridge in, so it's going you know, to shut down parts of Coolsville over the weekend uh, starting in December, so it's going to be a lot of headaches coming pretty soon. Really quick follow-up question because you mentioned it, uh, the side road inventory for Montgomery County that does not include Tacoma Park, right? I, I'm not sure because Rockville City did their own, so I don't know if we've gone back and done that. It may, I have to go check. I'll get back. I can, I can email Jessica and I can find out. Okay. Everybody, anything else? Thank you so much, yeah. Wade, for coming. Hey.